start off maybe just by going around with everyone. Which, which, which guy are you? I'm Randy Martin. <laughs> Yeah. I would offer that like as a case study, and you're leading us in. This is a, a, a partnership and participation. Right? Just to, to make sure, right? This is uh, group one is partnership and participation. Uh, group two is the organizational sustainability. Group three is community development. So, yeah, you know, different places. And again, of course, there's overlap. What we're trying to do uh, is to get enough of a sense of the working group that you want to form. And this will uh, then meet monthly from now until the conference with uh, uh, creating some of the framing for the overall conference and some of the particular programming that will be the spine that moves through the conference in terms of what kind of action agenda we're trying to set. Okay? And uh, out of our session today, hopefully, you know, I think first let's, let's listen to each other and, and have the conversation. Hopefully out of our conversation it will, uh, will emerge a couple people who want to be the co-facilitators to take responsibility for convening the group. Right? Obviously we'll, the three co-organizers will still be involved. Um, and we can help you with the resources just to convene and, and record the work that you're doing. Okay? So maybe we can start just by going around and, and if you can say a little bit about how the work that you're doing connects with at least what you hear or what you would aspire this group to be. Introduce myself first of all as a, as a white, so, white or a poet, um, and that connects me to a global and local community. I'm a member of uh, the Pan American Center for Business. Uh, but I'm also a, my name is uh, Sylvie Candé. Uh, I'm, I'm a poet. Um, and uh, that connects me to a uh, global and local community, although my work is best known in French speaking community. I'm also an educator. I, I was at some point part of the NYU community. Now I'm part of the Sunni system as an Africanist. Um, uh, and uh, I have, uh, just to restrict myself to the New York City area, I have lived in several communities, the village, uh, but also the Bronx and Harlem, where I reside uh, currently. Um, I, well, I was very attracted by uh, one of the books that was mentioned in the first document that I received, and that was the number four, Understanding and Leveraging Arts, Culture, and Humanities. And uh, I didn't find it in the, in the new uh, yeah. configuration. I, yeah. I, I suppose that it is part of book one, so that's uh, my presence here. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how my work will connect to the to the whole, but uh, I hope to be able to find a role in this endeavor. Um, the first remark that uh, I would like to make, based on what I've heard before, is that um, uh, I would like for the for the conference to elaborate a new vocabulary. It seems to me that. Um, uh, the way uh, things are formulated are, are binary at the moment, and the title seems to reflect that, communities and campuses. And it seems to me that uh, maybe it's a goal of the conference, uh, but we should invent a new vocabulary so that it doesn't seem that there are two entities uh, out there, uh, the higher education people and the community people, and find a way to formulate things a bit differently. Thank you. So it, people kind of crack up who know me for a long time that, what am I doing? I, this organization, higher ed, how does that ever happen? But it, it's sort of like what I always say to, to my students, um, which is, as young artists, I always try to get them out of the studio into the world, not because the studio is important, of course that's important, but you don't become an artist spending 24-7 in a studio, you spend some time in a studio. And I feel that way about the, the conference and the organization is that we, you know, we're committed to these partnerships, but how do you actually do that? And it takes rooms like this and building relationships and all the time that takes. Um, and then this notion of leverage, how can we, not just individually, where so many people are doing it, and some great and some not so great, but this idea of what a report can do, I'm really interested in, partly because, as Randy said earlier, um, our organization, the former director, Julie Allen, and the research director, Timmy, did write this document based on doing lots of interviews with people about the public scholarship they do, which has been used as a way to convene people in higher ed to continue, continue stretching 
but they see a scholarship. And I'm hoping that out of this, we will continue going back to your remark of well-being conference in how can what we're learning together here be used in conversations that will move this forward. And I've had the pleasure of getting to see what happens when you try to do something nationally, how much organizations are affected by the whole culture of other organizations in the same group. To say, well, if they're doing that, we better be considering that. This is what's happening now, so that there is the possibility of the whole being more than the sum of the parts. So. I'm Celia Tobias. I direct the nonprofit arts and education organization. For years, I uh, produced a series on television called I Am Dance of the Arts. And what we looked at, at was the multiplicity of voices that inform dance and within culture, history, education. So it's all about oral history. And what I'm very excited about is the idea of how uh, the artists and the resources that are in each individual community can pull back into uh, university school systems. And I suppose I'd really kind of like to see a cultural community service mandate in all of the schools. I mean, why not? New York City is a very special case. I mean, we have a bazillion artists. That's not to say that all of the schools and universities take advantage of, you know, even one sixteenth of what's available out there. Um, and they represent so many different cultures, uh, ethnic groups, uh, ages, that it would make all the difference in the world to better understand, as you're saying, who you are. You know, where do you come from? How do you relate? And I'm not saying to restrict it, you know, just to artists because of the idea of technology. I mean, you have engineers who are very creative. If you know scientists, my father was a scientist, an enormously creative individual who could also get pulled into this, you know, very same idea. But why are you, you know, sitting in the middle of a community and not reaching out to it and pulling in and learning as much as you possibly can? Yes, the whole concept of what is scholarship. Well, we have a very unique relationship with our uh, community-based college, York College. It's a very rewarding, a very exciting, and a mutually beneficial relationship. And let me explain why. When we first met uh, the, the York College faculty, and the idea was that they wanted a partnership with community-based organization. And how do you make that engaging and constructive? So we decided to work on a model. It, it's still evolving, but I think it's a model that can be replicated. But they began by inviting me to go and speak to the classes, some of the classes in the uh, teacher's ed department. So I would go out there. It was part of the recruitment tool, but eventually it led to uh, an exchange of culture, a lot of other things that were happening. So I would go in and lecture the class. It would not be about basic education, but it would be about the values of being a lifelong learner and a teacher. And so then the students would come to the center and want to volunteer as an intern, and they would be greater than all of that. But instead of just observing, we had them actively participate. Eventually, that led to us being invited to sit on the uh, advisory board for the college, the teachers' ed, you know, department. And part of that was to have some input into the curriculum, the admission policy, and the whole gamut of other things that were happening. So it's not just one group giving; it's a give and take. And this relationship has been so beneficial that the students who come to the center, they become lifelong partners because when they come out there, we also mentor them. I mean, we acculturate them to what we do. So again, there's a two-way street, and if it becomes a two-way street, where it's mutually beneficial to both of and whether it's a give and take, a lot can happen, and I think that's a model that can be replicated. It's still important, but it can be replicated. College, Columbia University, um, and I, I do my work in comic books, doing my dissertation in that medium, and I, I think it speaks to what you started us on, and a lot of people have followed up on, the, the importance of the multiplicity of ways we make new so I'm, I'm sort of offering this document to talk about those things, but also to demonstrate it by, by pushing it through academia in a, in a way that doesn't look like stuff that normally comes through. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of more to say than that, except that there's a exciting to hear the different voices and, and different ways we're thinking about, you know, thinking about what scholarship is, and, and that's what drew me to Imagining America in the first place.
Nick. Oh, Nick Susanis. Nick Susanis. Um, and you're referring to here. Hi, I'm Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, I work with Randy and Monta in the Art and Public Policy Program here at NYU at Tisch, and uh, I'm a poet. And uh, I also work uh, with a group called the Young People's Project, and they do math literacy, but really leadership development. And the whole purpose is to support the young people involved in, in being the voice and being the change and determining um, their lives. And so I'm really interested in how in this process, and it was said earlier, younger people can, can be part of the shaping on every level. Um, as well, I, I um, am working with a program in, in within our program that Jan started called the Office of Community Connections at NYU, and so we're really interested in helping students create opportunities to connect with community as artists in ways that are respectful, equitable, uh, responsible, magical, and very interested in, in anyone who wants to uh, connect with that and help figure out what that what that will mean for the students. And also uh, in response to some uh, statements that were made, I've been involved with educators in developing an alternative school that tries to kind of push uh, and, and reimagine, in fact, the ways in which young people can um, think about their own education and, and support teachers in doing things that are outside of those restrictions that, that we're living with in the, system, in the school system. And the other is, how do we, um, in, in reimagining, how do we um, stretch or push at the form, at the form of our conference and our work together actually um, being the art. So that our document, the art. The manifestation part, and so how do we have in all aspects of, you know, of a conference? Mind's a higher education component, right? Think about those kind of spaces, um, and what could, it could mean for something for like the work of the Young People's Project to also be credit bearing. If we're if we're talking about these equitable partnerships, how can we think about dual enrollment and degree granting things that aren't just in the space of the university? Um, as a graduate student, I think about what type of professionalizations uh, people are a part of, and how we can recognize the work that is happening outside of, outside of here too. Uh, with community colleges, I think there, there needs to be a lot about what does it mean not just to be a community college student, uh, what does it mean to be a college of the community, and what does it mean also to provide structures and, and infrastructure for people who move between high school, an AA, a BA, an MFA, and anything like that, and, and to do that in an, in an engaged manner. Um, and when we're talking about Imagine America's tenure team report, I'm also really interested in a, a non-tenure team report, right? a contingent faculty report. How can you be a part of a university in a way that you're not, that, that you're choosing to maybe not have that be your full-time employment, but you're having a healthy, sustainable, and tenable relationship with higher education, uh, sort of on your terms, but with the benefits and support structures that may be coming with. So how can we, out of this space, sort of create the framework to allow that to happen? What is the mentoring? What, is, what kind of framework for partnership could we articulate and roll out that could start to become a very influential document that um, doesn't collapse the diversity, but that maps it, and that maybe also starts to serve a function of mapping, right? an organizing tool, whereby people can start to link the different work that they're doing and use IA, specifically this is, is an initiative in, in IA to do a community-based knowledge mapping uh, process that would allow people to search for each other and find each other. Right? So I think that, that question, what, what does it mean not to lose the specificity and the particularity of what you're doing, but be able to, to have a ground where you could come together. Uh, and that would also involve using certain kinds of technological uh, devices and, and innovations. And then I think the other thing that seemed to me to be a clear current uh, that we heard before, during, and no doubt after is, is the question of, of youth. And there's no doubt that youth, both demographically, critically, politically, are the point of intersection between community-based organizations and higher education.
that, that they are the, 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 the demographic, the population. And whether they have access or not, whether they're recognized or not, whether they have a place or not. So I think that that may also invite us to think, do we need, are we, or how might we encourage something like a youth summit? We, what's interesting, we have uh, uh, the uh, Graduate Student Summit that takes place, uh, but interestingly, those are folks who already have found their way, for whatever reason, went into higher education. Right? If we're going to be serious about this uh, and ask, you know, what kind of invitation, what kind of structure could we devise that would bring youth to the table and, and give enough autonomy so that folks could feel like they were uh, sharing the knowledge that they had, the demands that they had, what angered them, the kinds of frustrations, the limitations. Um, so it seems like that would be another thing that would also uh, is a point, is specifically a point of intersection. Right? And I think that's another thing we might want to think of. What is it from the perspective of partnership that compels us to work together to do things that we couldn't do apart? Right? That would be another way of thinking. So those are just a few things that, that I heard. I don't know. Perhaps folks either want to respond to those things as, as uh, agenda items, or add others, or uh, refigure those. I, I guess one of the dialogues that goes on is college ready and our population, and understanding that they might not be ready for a four-year college and dealing with um, community colleges like Guardia. They really n understand, so they have that two years in to build their GPA, but also financially, that the cost that they incur is not so great so they can phase into for their third and four year into a four year college. And they, how do you say, there's not that much debt compared to going to four years. But that was a model that is talked about a lot with our students. Because they have aspirations for that four year, but they have to transition from that two year, whether financially or again academically. And it does seem to me that debt is a key term in this conversation, right? That, that certainly, you know, one part of the financial debacle was a claim that you could extend home ownership, right, and cross red lines and uh, get a new populations into debt, right? And then, of course, when that uh, house collapsed, those were the populations that were somehow blamed right, for the financial crisis itself, right? We're also looking, I think, at a very major debt bubble for higher education which may make the business model as we know it unsustainable. And it's interesting, we talked about this a little bit last time, that the highest debt loads are borne by the for-profit sector. Right? So for-profit, the proprietary universities that are, are, the, are the one sector that's a majority minority student population have the highest debt loads. Right, of any of the segments of higher education. But if we start to bring together these different meanings of debt and then flip it and say, so what kinds of, what kinds of indebtedness are we talking about that um, uh, not just community organizations, but communities embody and deliver? It seems to me that's another way of thinking about launching this question of partnership into a broader national conversation. That if we can't rethink debt and mutual indebtedness, right, we're gonna be stuck just paying bills. Right. And, and that kind of uh, indentured servitude right, that we're now invited uh, to think through. So I think that's another thing it seems to me that we want to ask out of ourselves. What kind of knowledge do we want to produce? What is community-based knowledge and how is it different than disciplinary knowledge and other forms of, of knowledge structures? You have to look at the system that you have in place here. <laughs> Economic, I mean, <laughs> this whole notion of uh, the capitalist system being the ideal. And that's a very challenging one, that's an uphill battle. But the other thing that I'd like to address here too is that to engage this partnership, I think each partner has to ask the question, what is it that they want from the relationship? I mean, what is it that each partner wants from this relationship? Because I mean, that hasn't been uh, uh, defined, well defined. And most often it seems that it's one group doing another group a favor, mm -hmm. as opposed to treating each other as equals. Now, with your college, we begin on the premise that we are all equal, irrespective of the resources that each of us have, irrespective of the capacities that we have. That we, as small as we, we, we are, we have a lot to offer the universe. So based on that premise, we are treated as equals. Um, the other thing here I like to look at too, people think that the larger is better than, you know, the bigger the thing, the better it is. 
and most often universities tend to lend a lot of support to well-organized, well-structured, larger not-for-profit organizations to the detriment of smaller ones. And in fact, if you look at corporate America and the not-for-profit world, the smaller ones are the high achievers. They are the ones that are coming with innovation, that are changing things around. But you don't often hear about them, but they don't make the news in the headlines. So that ought to be changed. Too. And lastly, I think, if the relationship evolves in such a way that the community partners become the conduit to higher education, I think is, it will be a remarkable way of uh, meeting the needs of inner city youth who don't look at college as an option. If you use it, if you properly develop the conduit and use it, it could be the, the, the channel which you funnel these young people into higher education. So let's look at those things. <laughs> <laughs> when you made the comment about running out of real estate, and so um, in white youth in Ghana, Dubai, right, Abu Dhabi, it just also made me think about. I do international work with young people. We have very strong partnerships in Ghana and Brazil, and um, so this idea of reimagining or imagining America, I think, also needs to imagine it in a very global way, because if in fact, regardless of whether colleges are, you know, planting their seeds on other soil, um, we also, I think, need to be thinking about how, I mean, our, our communities are global as it is, right? And so we need to really think about what that means in terms of the work, both at the community level and um, higher ed, and just in terms of those partnerships. And when you have young people who want to get into higher ed, right, they can't because of documentation issues, and that's obviously a huge um, piece and, and a problem and issue that needs to be addressed. And the Latino young people, they're, they're boxed in. And if it were European American young people coming in, it, it's okay for them to learn right. whatever they need to learn. Like so that inequity of okay, so attitude and racism and discriminatory practices that get translated in different ways, right? right. That's what I'm saying, call it what it is, you know? <laughs> so, okay. So you learn vocation because that's less of that than being just sort of. Uh, you know, right. Rather than creating an educated it individual, exactly. you're creating like a worker. Right. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Sure. Uh, <laughs> public history consultant, but I I worked for the Museum of Chinese in America um, for a dozen years. And uh, I also came because Marta said, you should come. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm pissed off about is I think feeling that our nonprofit cultural institutions are being hijacked by corporate America. That's what I'm pissed off about. I feel like I'm tired of being told you have to think like a business, that you have to be more business oriented that you in order to survive. And I feel like they need to learn from us in order to create a better society and a better um, um, just you know, just like a better, yeah, better society. And I feel like we're in this trap, you know, as especially smaller cultural institutions, where you know it's that it's that cycle that you're talking about. If you're successful, you get more money. If you're not successful, it's like you must be doing something wrong in your business plan. Versus, there are all these. 
variables that we are constantly trying to challenge and overcome that is you know basically the mission of our organizations so you know I just feel like it's not a level playing field and it's couched as one and we're being I feel like we're being accused of not being business savvy enough and it's really hard sometimes when the work that you do is you know for the hopefully for the greater good of society and that can't always be done you know in this like budget matrix you know that like you know one educated child equals like x number of dollars like that just doesn't compute to me and i think that's i think that i feel like that's sort of the quandary that a lot of our institutions are and this is a question which i just um took a group of young people to puerto rico for cultural intensive and um and one of the museums had Burger King Gallery, I mean, serious, Walmart Gallery. I mean, uh, beautifully painted, you know, very tasteful, but still, it's no different than the Medellin Movado and, and Vogue magazine and so on and so forth, right? Now, the question is, like, even that corporate model doesn't a silence for you because you only get funding if you have a certain perspective and, you know what I'm saying? So that, what does that do to the artistic voice of the stuff? Because when you think about resources, you're constantly having to make decisions. So, do this, or we do that. And, you know, you end up sometimes in a situation where you're kind of like, well, we have the money for this. It's, it's still our mission, but it's not exactly, you know, really what we want to be doing, but maybe we can actually maybe use some of that money also to like feed into that other program that, you know, it's a constant juggle and it's something that like, you know, let's put it on the table, like we don't, we don't say this to the funders, <laughs> we don't say like, yeah, give us that $25,000, we're actually going to use 20000 of it because we're going to pull in our volunteers and we're going to pull in, you know, so that maybe 5000 can actually go into something that, you know, we know is going to make a big difference, but it's not as sexy or maybe it's, you know, not, so, I mean, it's just a, I guess I, I'm just wondering, like, you know, with this conference, I'm really, I, I would love, I mean, it, it sounds like the goal is to really work at chipping away and reframing, you know, how we talk about things, how we think about things. And so I'm just asking myself, like, what, what kind of, you know, organizational premises have to be rethought. Like, you know, the last round table I came that you organized, Martha, I mean, it was, you know, we talked about that the 501c3 is a trap. And that totally, I mean, that really kind of was like a punch in my stomach, but it was kind of true. Like, that's really also how I was kind of feeling. But at the same time, it gives us you know, it's it's this huge... I think we have to do it. And what we have to do is there's a shifting paradigm with us. Uh, and what it does that look like? So how do we want to reframe it? Right? Because that's what you live. Because how do we want to reframe it? That's the, the activism, if you will, of the discussion. So we need to think of what that reframing looks like and what and you how know, we put um, it into operation. The university can influence our practice. I, I'm Liz Shevchenko, and I was a founding director so of, of a nonprofit yeah, called the International Coalition of Sites and Conjunts, which is a network of different historic sites in uh, different parts of the world that address um, historic uh, struggles for social justice or human rights and, and use those histories to address contemporary issues working with their um, very deeply, very, very divided communities. Um, after I had been uh, leading the organization for about 10 years, it was when Obama made this um, declaration of close Guantanamo, and um, the membership sort of came together to launch the new It was in the corporate space, particularly in the hedge fund industry, how things are selfish, etc., and the love of money, kind of um, just so many different dynamics. So now this role as a New York Museum, College Council Ambassador, just want to really learn to uh, 
we have you know, bridge the gap of, between uh, the community uh, and higher uh, education. Uh, less sorry, talk, no more words. action. So uh, that, that collaborating with uh, like-minded individuals like you all yes is very us. important to me because I think uh, the one thing uh, people don't do enough is, is collaborate. A lot of us have uh, shared interests and shared goals, but oftentimes people, you know, they work by themselves. So I'm looking to just uh, you know, build more. And um, in, re in regards to bridging the gap with community and higher education as it relates to sustainability, uh, why this is very important to me is because on the 18th, um, this is an open invitation to everyone. On the 18th of February, um, the, um, at Rutgers Newark, they're having like, the 32nd annual Mary Thompson Wright Lecture Series. And um, it's the longest standing lecture series on uh, African American history at uh, Paul Robinson Center. And the theme this year is um, taking good care, uh, particularly uh, looking at how uh, health has been within the black community. And then, so what's important to me is uh, bridging that gap between how health has been within our African American community with all the college students uh, within the Newark and surrounding areas, you know? How these students can now be involved and, uh, you know, be a part of the community. So I think uh, something like this is just very interesting. So I'm just looking more to learn. So now that when I go back to uh, the Newark Museum and work with the rest of the college council members to really say, hey, listen, this is hands-on information that I'm able to learn from these roundtable discussions and really implement it right away. And, uh, in uh, at Rutgers, New York. So I'm looking forward to working with everyone and looking forward to what the topic is. Next, how do we shift the education possible? We need some cultural way to serve as How do we develop exchanging in this new technology and beauty of friends that is different than what was maybe 10 years ago? Because now everybody has a phone before nobody had a phone, right? Uh, so I think that they have have been shifts and what I'm hearing is that the shifts that need to happen both in higher education and community level has not responded to those shifts. And I think that I'm hearing also that there's a thing there's there's thinking that has to be shifted. Right. Probably uh, the biggest shift was in the civil rights movement, and, and, you know, in, in, that I've experienced, right? In terms of a conversation being introduced that changed this nation, right? I think we were at that crux. What is that conversation? What is that narrative that would change this nation? So the good thing is to find out what, what you need. And Cynthia was getting to it, you know, I think, in terms of, you know, yeah. the role of corporations in, in, in artistic creation because then who who drives the voice of the artist or the institution, right, based on what resources are available. And if I'm hearing you, then the question becomes, how then do we shift our reality to form partnerships that are equitable, that we can share the resources that we do have and the intelligence that we have to function differently? Um, and all of it grounded in, right, what is sustainable for whatever work we're doing as individual artists, as institutions, as communities, right? And what does that look like going forward? What does it look like for us to partner? Right? The reality of, of, of actually putting those partnerships together. Because, you know, there are short-term partners where you work on a project and then you're gone. And then in this economic environment, some of us may need to talk about that long-term collaboration where we collaborate, sort of, dare I use the word, merge. And that's a scary thought for many of us. As you get older, it will not be scary to you. So get ready. But we need to think about that because how many of us can the economic environment sustain? How many of us, how many dance groups, how many theater groups, how many historic houses, how many X, how many Ys? We may all... There may be a need for all of us to survive, but it's not going to be easy for all of us to survive. 
and there needs to be a series of options. It's almost exactly. I mean, what what you may think is survival, and what I may think is to your point. You know, you you get used to you get a piece of land, and you get used to holding on to that piece of land when indeed you may not need to, in order to do what was originally your mission. So I think always staying in touch with what it is that you founded your organization to do, and some can scale up and some don't need to. And there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into that. I don't know that it's for this conference, but for me, it's important thinking. That's part of it, because I think you hit upon it in terms of the strategic plan, because I mean, and it seems to me that scale is both. As the state president of the Caribbean Cultural Center, you know, we're moving to a building. All the consultants have gotten. to scale up based on doing this? Are thinking in an old model. You know what I'm saying? And I'm saying, like, that's not going to work. And I know it's not going to work. So it's sort of to go to your point, in order to get funding, I know I have to have a strategic plan, but I know that hustling for a grant is not going to be the answer. You know what I'm saying? So that I think we have to like to do, however, then how does you know maybe part of funding? How does capacity build? How does marketing? How how do we do it? Different on one more giving the shift that we are experiencing right now. Because there's a major shift, and what does that? What's the narrative? Oh, let's call now. What words are we using? It doesn't mean you single-handedly are part of it, but who wants How to look at thinking and come together a little, little more, more often than the once a month of these meetings? I just wanted to add with, with every part of the uh, you know, yeah. ground that we have to make up, yeah. there also has to be an extra point in which we're anticipating, because I feel like we're constantly trying to play catch up to the shifts that have already taken place and have, you know, we're, we're late in responding, but also not anticipating now enough. So I just want to put that out there for whatever the art is that we are thinking about. Yeah, because things are changing in, 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 in ways that you know, it's hard. Uh, and change, I think, you know, going to your point, change has to be part of the strategic move or whatever that art is because it, it, things are shifting in ways that are, it, I think, I've never seen things shift as quickly as the shifting, right? And that may be because of communication, networking, social media, but the shift is like this. So how then do you factor that into whatever you plan? And also, uh, and I'm coming to you, Arturo, uh, and, and you, the, the international scope of the work that we're doing, we're no longer local. Any of us, I don't care if it's a community base, but all of us are international. All of us are working because we're on the internet, communicating with people in Brazil or whatever. There's a whole reality that we're working with, and do we know how to Great, uh, let's also work be sure that we have a sign and sheet for everybody in this group. I want to get back to the shit that you're talking about. Uh, one of the things that I put here is that we're all just going to be here. Okay, let's just take uh, like five minutes. Hunter, did I miss anybody besides? Besides Tiffany, uh, Avery, and this group. Some arts are operating by some of the member organizations with uh, groups of formerly incarcerated uh, students. Uh, but I don't think
Music Arts has been fully um, uh, mined as a way to really build this network and as a way to really connect uh, people who aren't going to sit around a table and have this kind of conversation because it's boring. Um, and then also to represent in more vivid ways um, why this is so important and what the possibilities are. So that's the kind of community-based project that uh, in New York that most connects with, with this. Um, also at Columbia, there's the opportunity, I'm, I'm hearing, like there are, there are a number of different themes that I've heard that I just want to put out there and then just hear you talk about like what would you like to work on and who else would you like to be part of this conversation. One of them we've already said, which is we could potentially work on thinking of who needs to be brought together and who would really have the tough conversations to to change, to, to open up a set of possibilities so that this seems real. And this could be done in many different venues. It could be done in ways that are really building on the momentum of students and of community members, and it could be done in ways that are bringing um, some of the, of the various kinds of leadership together. So I hear that as one thing. And I also hear this like emerging like, form of like, the idea of these centers that are located in communities that are focused on creating housing and kind of wraparound support for community for groups that have been um, left out and building the arts into that and then connecting universities to that. So it's a different model of development that's not coming from the university saying, oh, I want to move into your neighborhood. How am I going to do that in a way that won't get you guys angry at me? <laughs> Which is most of what economic, university-based economic development is coming in that direction. So wouldn't it be, I mean, I think there, the fact that this is both lots of folks who are in the community and people who are housed in universities but who have these values, maybe he opens up a possibility to say, what would a model look like that was driven by community needs, community opportunities, community innovation, and that brings universities into that to support that in ways that also support teachers, support students, support the art, um, support new kinds of artists. So I hear that also coming out um, as a possibility, a number of you thinking about you know, your work in those ways and then ways in which that all of that could be supported by the work of artists and the communication of work of artists. So I don't know, just to get us started, don't feel limited by any of those comments, but just, let's now just have a conversation. Can I, yeah. this, um, a concern that I have with Imagine America, the way that it's being framed and discussed here, is that it's artists and scholars in public life, and I see a lot of artists here, and I hear a lot about the arts, and those things are sometimes, those are often the same people, and I don't want to say that they're too, but I don't hear the humanity side of it, and the faculty side. So, I know you're here, and I know there's a few other people. I just, as a concern that I have, and I, I mean, I think that, you know, arts have a role to play in what you're talking about with um, formerly incarcerated youth, but like where are the humanities and how can we bring As that to the table? Yeah. You know, so that's just a thing. Yeah. But that these are happening in separate spheres. So the linking project that I'm doing, that we're, we're managing, we're going we'll to figure out how to get the community based organizations to the table because those are really too focused on the, you know, the humanities, arts, culture, and administrative side. So I think you're raising a really important question and our challenge is to really figure out how to get these partnerships off the ground where, where people can really engage with, well, where are the interlocking interests here? And how can this be built into a real kind of collaboration? I'll just say one other thing, which is one of the reasons I am excited, even though I completely agree with you, is that I think the fact that there, if there is a group of community organizations that come together and can then approach or work with, that has in it faculty, that has in it community, it, it starts the dynamic in a different way that I think has the potential to, to produce something that really is more collaborative yeah, than I'll it just comes say, in the other direction. We work, not, we, we don't fund scholars, we fund public humanities organizations, right? So like, 
the equivalent of an art, a community arts organization, we would just say community heritage, you know, whether that's a history or literature or, you know, that side of things focus. So there's a lot of overlap and stuff like that. But I just want to make it clear that, you know, the NEH often funds scholarship. That's not necessarily what we do. So just to and, be clear. And also just that the interlocking pieces may involve organizations like Imagine America. So that Imagine America will have to be an umbrella for a certain constituency, but Imagine America can then begin to work with other, other large umbrella organizations. I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, one way of linking uh, everyone together are working on big questions or, um, for example, like diversity or um, history, because then you bring in many disciplines. And, I, you know, this is, we want to break down the disciplinary boundaries to focus on the questions that are going to have an impact on both the campus and the community. And I think that that's, that's where we can begin to think about how, what kind of model, what does that look like uh, for Imagine America and American America's partners. So, you know, with, with very few exceptions, and, and, and there's a sin at this table, but I'm sure there are other skills. In my relationship, my work in relationships with some of the colleges, uh, I've always found that there's a, a, a faculty culture that everyone is immersed in and can't leave it and don't allow anyone other voices in it. So I'm saying perhaps 80, 90 percent of the faculty are, are probably immersed in that type of culture, looking at each other, talking to each other, and 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 seeing themselves as the center of the universe, and why can't we, us from the outside, appreciate that and come with our heads bowed? And, uh, so, I mean, the ch uh, <laughs> with, 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 with the faculty here, we're preaching to the converted. Uh, the faculty that's not here, how do you get their answers in here? Well, so that's a big and like a strategy for moving forward. I know there's been a lot of talk in IA about town halls, and I can imagine a, a kind of orchestrated um, movement of town halls across the country that might come out of the conference that would have a, a sort of um, a set of goals that would be common goals, but that would be locally driven and would take place in different parts of the country. Connecting that with the fact that this is an organization that focuses on arts, culture, and humanities. I'm looking at Brian over there just because I know him uh, and know what he does. Is that could be done in a way that isn't only a bunch of talking heads. That it could be done using performance and using spoken word and using arts of various kinds, using story core, using to build to and then move out from uh, town hall. So I think, you know, that's a, that's an interesting idea. I mean, there are different ways to do this. And I'm not sure these are either or. That's for y'all to do that's all to decide. That. It could be either top down, bottom up. Get the, favor, the sympathetic trustees and leadership as well as the police. But what I'd like to suggest the next steps is to make sure that we have the voices and visions of at least young polling leaders and looking for polling of at least one of the young people who represent in today's generation and are now very articulate and their voices are the voices that we need to hear. So how would you we go about getting so right now we have to be in the awareness campaign. We have to raise awareness of one, rest practices, and two, how these systems that are already going on are perpetually damaging and hemorrhaging us to from the notion of survival all the way up to not fully being able to be all that we can be. So for these conversations to really have any weight, as, as you said, in terms of like, just talking about them and not affecting policy, the more people are aware, the more we can use that leverage um, to then have the advocacy and then the accountability. So I'm
what um, took place in the sessions, what were some of the key points, and then just talk a little bit about uh, organizational and logistical uh, points going forward. So maybe Susan, do you want to start? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, so we we had a terrific group of, um, of um, artists, faculty, community folks, all mushed together into different roles. Um, I, I'll just cut right to the chase, so we have time to talk. I, I can hear you. I think that um, the key points that we that we came to uh, were that number one, there is a real um, opportunity and need to come together around cutting-edge approaches to community de um, economic development in the arts, to do that in a way that builds on some of the, um, what we already know about what works, both from practices, like uh, we, we heard um, some things like, um, uh, what, what's the invest? Locavest. 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 Uh, and what was the other um, great idea? Impact investing. Impact investing. Uh, we also heard about ideas of new kinds of community-based institutions focusing on really wraparound services, housing, et cetera, that are locating the arts right into those institutions and that then bringing universities in as partners with those institutions. Uh, and that, So there was an interest in pulling together the right group of people uh, that included both bottom-up, Occupy Wall Street, youth, students, community members, and top-down, people with real power and influence, if it can happen, people who are on the boards of trustees, trying to involve the faculty. But to get those people at the table to first identify what we know uh, about what, what these cutting-edge practices are, to mobilize a real interest in, in um, making those kinds of, uh, of innovations more central and more poor, uh, and uh, figuring out how they can be built more into policy uh, and a way in which pe one suggestion for a way in which that could happen would be to um, mobilize this group, get the right group of people to the table, um, identify what some of these um, practices are uh, and what these uh, changes, policy changes are, and then to think about developing a set of town halls around the country uh, that would use the arts and culture and humanities as a way to both communicate the urgency of this work, uh, mobilize lots of uh, national attention around the work, and hopefully produce some policy around the work. Uh, and the way in which the group decided to constitute itself to take the next set of steps uh, was to, um, we have a sign-up sheet with names and email addresses. We have people, hopefully, who um, I volunteered to be either co-facilitators or steering on a steering committee, and the next step would be to plan a meeting of this group um, that would really address some of the choices about direction since the ambition of the group was so big uh, to figure out how this is actually going to move forward. The group had a couple of questions for IA. One of them is, you know, this resource question, how is this going, the, the people who are facilitating and the group itself, how is that going to be supported? Uh, a second is how do we work back from the conference? So to think about like the time frame for when these various activities need to take place for this to actually um, come to fruition. And the last, very importantly, is uh, how can we make it so that the community members who actually plan this can come to the conference and be members of IA? I can answer all three of those. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. One is we're, we're, we're ending our fundraising right now. We made it through one group, and if we get the money, part of the money would go to these groups. That, that would be an important part of the money. Two is um, anyone who helps uh, works on the work on the Congress, on the Congress, <laughs> on the conference comes for free. And we even did get some money, thanks to New York Council for the Humanities, that will help cover those expenses, but we're doing less less meals at the conference because that's what usually kills us. And we don't need to provide transportation. Like many places we do conferences, we need to pay for buses to get people around. But in New York, we can take public transportation. Um, and the third question was, um, oh, how work back from the conference about the time frame? Well, we're all going to be working on that. Thanks. Yeah. Cynthia and Melissa, who are the co-facilitators, and Wayne. Let them. Um, <laughs> I, 
guess well we you know we we each you know kind of took turns talking about what we were motivated what motivated us to come here today um, and I think what sort of came out was um, sort of both this feeling that that there needs to be sort of an on the ground sort of collective problem solving amongst you know um, community organizations is recognition that um, you know even though we we represent our communities that that we we still need to be more proactive in really um, bringing members of our community to the table and so that was really um, sort of a lot of people's concerns um, as well as sort of um, how how can we um, really identify the main paradigmatic shifts that are happening in this country today and one um, being really thinking through how do we educate our youth for the next generation um, what are the big changes in how we're thinking about what um, is happening in the United States today you know we talked about the civil rights movement as sort of the last major paradigmatic shift to what what's the shift that we are in today uh, intellectual shift that we're in today and um, how does technology change our civic participation and um, you know, we kind of, these were sort of these main shifts that kind of came up and, and we were trying to come up with, um, we were recognizing that there's a need for a narrative for this shift. And, um, and then how do we, you know, kind of craft that, that will hopefully sort of push like a larger political strategy. Um, and you know all of this of course was grounded in this discussion about sustainability because you know you can't really talk about sustainability without really talking about these large um, these large factors and so we also kind of discussed that we need to not just react to shifts but to anticipate and so we're hoping that um, this conference and the work that we're all doing towards the conference will sort of help us um, put into words, really, um, and kind of give everyone tools for talking about 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 this. Um, and I think another point that someone had made was, you know, it's not just about sustaining, but it's about flourishing. So, you know, why, you know, our goal shouldn't just be sustaining. <laughs> it should really be, you know, pushing beyond that. Melissa, Wayne, you had a um, I'll just add, in terms of resources, we spend a, a good amount of time talking about human capital and whether that's volunteer hours, in-kind services, how can we work together as a community in really um, using those resources to kind of fill in the gap for what we hope to get but don't always get um, financially. So uh, I think that'll be a big part of what we talk about as well. And collaboration. Wayne, did you have anything that we got? That, that was pretty great coverage. The only thing I would add is that we brushed just very slightly on the 501c3 trap, and that's a conversation that could be made. Okay. <laughs> well, let, let me just start from the partnership group, and then folks can, can add in. Um, uh, one of the things we realized we wanted to start with as we move forward was the question, what do we want from the relationship? Uh, of campus community partnerships. So, to, so to, to begin with that that question as a as a foundation, and then we identified some areas um, that we could imagine uh, doing some work in. One is developing a critical vocabulary, right? rather than taking for granted uh, some avalanche of words and, and terms that we use to really both interrogate what those words are, to see what what which are the ones that are serviceable, how they fit within a broader uh, analytic framework, what kinds of, 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 uh, of critical focus uh, they can help bring to bear uh, on our work together. And that, that vocabulary is not just done with words, we also need to think about what are the forms of no uh, that, that community-based knowledge takes, um, where does it take place, who's at the table, if we're talking about campus community uh, partnerships, what are the different kinds of ways of, of, of giving credit, uh, validation, employment, uh, sharing of resources, 
if uh, we're talking about sort of decentering what has been the university's claim on critical knowledge, what is that? How does that actually show up? How do we know that that's happening? Uh, so if we claim that partnerships are mutually beneficial, we have a way of, of knowing that, right? And 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 that means therefore um, developing um, both models of partnership, but also networks of mentorship, ways in which we can find each other, ways in which we can map the work that we do beyond individual one-to-one uh, -one kinds of uh, relationships. Then in terms of what was observed about you know, uh, who, who we are presently not, uh, and say what the question of, of youth is and how we really attend to that seriously, what would it mean to have a youth summit at the conference, uh, thinking about youth as really the key intersection between uh, community-based and campus work. These are the, these, this is the demographic, right? And, and uh, the questions of an unequal access, validation, understanding, imagination of, of what these institutions and who they serve becomes crucial uh, in, in that discussion. Um, then thinking in, in terms of, uh, of imagining America and, and the question of where America is and what it is uh, and the often um, uh, 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 presumptive claims that the, the university gets to hold the universal and the global and to the community belongs the, the local and the immediate to sort of undo that particular divide to, to think about the ways in which community knowledge is already uh, national and global uh, to think about um, uh, what it means to be able to have these uh, circuits of people moving through these different sites and not have one claim uh, uh, to be the general and the other uh, uh, the, the particular. So what would it mean to, to unseat those um, kinds of opposition? So if we can build from the critical vocabulary to the models of the work, to the forms of, of, of implementation, uh, we would think of working towards policy documents that could become models for, for these relationships uh, at, a, at a broader scale. So that was the final point of how do we imagine scaling up from the particular work that we do. Uh, are there other things that um, we're discussing folks want to add? We talked about global, right? Global communities and the idea of global existing here within New York City, but also global partnerships and ways in which we engage with the world. Yeah, that was brought up in our group as well. And uh, Arturo and Juara were very focused on the international communication that we need to, you know, that we all represent because we all are part of international communities. So that, you know, just because we are located in a local doesn't mean that we're not international or global. So let's just talk a little bit about logistics for, for next steps. We, our hope is that these working groups would convene about once a month with the aim of proposing and developing concrete programming ideas, and that if we're convening together live, we want the form of those of the programs that we devise for the conference to reflect what's unique and distinctive about us. Right. So what are all, using all of our knowledge of art and design and humanities uh, and culture right, to, to make a difference for what these sessions actually look like. Um, I would say just, just continuing kind of some of the conference logistics, usually the conference uh, 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 call asks for um, uh, proposals, uh, what Jan, by, by like uh, late spring? Uh, no, well, probably like in March. The call will go out later next, this month. Yes. And well, maybe, can you remember, I'm sorry, maybe six weeks down the road, be, certainly before semester ends. Yeah. Right? So what you might want to be thinking about is just coming up with some sort of placeholder ideas, right, of the kinds of programs that you would like to uh, put in uh, so that we can sort of sketch them into the conference program. And then I think probably by the end of the summer, we're actually putting a conference program up. Yeah. And that can have more detailed uh, descriptions if you're talking about uh, having something that takes place in a particular place that does a particular kind of work. If you yourself as a group have produced a document that you want people to consider beforehand, if you have a kind of proposed policy document or critique or critical intervention, that can be disseminated beforehand. So and we the, always do different kinds of sessions. There's seminars where people are asked to do things beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, round tables. There are workshops. Um, they tend to be very interactive, the session, one way or another. Is it possible to have some of the sessions in the organizations throughout the city? Because yeah. it seems to me that if you're in New York City yeah. and not coming out of a college, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So it would seem that, you know, 
uh, they need to be site activities that are integral to the conference. Absolutely. So the idea is that Friday afternoon, yeah. all of the sessions would take place at sites throughout the city. And some of those presumably would come from folks in this room, and some would come from other um, New York City-based uh, IA members who also have their particular community partners. So the, that whole part of the conference would be given over. And I think, again, it's important that we, as, as conference planners, have a way of building in what was taken from those sessions back into our, our plenary conversations on Saturday so that we have a, a way of building in momentum over the course of the three days so that by Sunday we can say, here's what we're going to do next. Uh, catch us if you can. <laughs> I think the other thing in terms of, of logistical support, certainly you know, folks are, are, are more than welcome to meet any place, but if you do need a space to convene, we certainly can, can help provide a meeting room. Uh, Tita, who, uh, as you see, is our resident videographer, uh, uh, can uh, video document uh, the, the sessions that you're doing so that we can have an ongoing record of, of the work that, that is taking place. If you need, uh, say, web-based support, if you're uploading documents or notes and you want to share those, uh, we can use the IA platform uh, in order to do that. But you should also tell us what are some of your administrative and organizational uh, needs. Are there things that we're missing that would help facilitate how you are doing this work? Is there going to be a general call? Also. Yes. So, so basically, the conference has kind of a, a double structure. One is it's rooted in this work, but that we're sort of both driving the local aspect of the work, but also the the spine, the, the conceptual uh, and, and action oriented spine of the conference. And then, based on this document that we've come up with, we'll tweak it one more time based on the comments that we got today, uh, and use that as the basis for the call for the, for the national uh, organization. So again, what we're doing is bringing together the, the national and the New York, I'm not going to call it local, uh, uh, as, as the actual way of, of convening the, the conference. And, sorry. and I was just going to say, so the, the, the three days will also inform if someone is submitting a proposal uh, from somewhere else. Uh, in the country, we're asking them to think about this call and its structure, and we'll program them in a way that mo makes the most sense for the three-day progression that we're describing. Just one one possibility that we're certainly thinking about um, if, with the full part, the linking project at Architecture of Full Participation is to have some um, period of time. It could be during that afternoon of site visits, but we haven't figured out exactly when, but there, where there would be actually a workshop uh, for institutions that wanted to participate in that project. And so that format also might exist for the work that these groups would generate, where there could be um, not only sessions that are you know, sharing the work, whatever, but they could be actual working sessions where you could bring together people from communities around the country and partnerships around the country uh, to collaborate, to workshop in the way that you've been doing, building up to the conference and generate uh, some momentum coming out of the conference. So that could be part of what you put in for your request for proposal. Other questions or concerns or interest in how we move forward? So, so the facilitators for each one of the um, uh, working groups, or whatever that particular structure is, uh, should be able to reach out to the people that we have uh, contact with. We'll also post the meeting times, which again, we'll, I, I think we'll stay with Friday afternoons, if, if that's okay with everyone, since it seems to be working for folks here. Right? Uh, and think again about doing that in roughly a month's time. Uh, we're also talking about having another round table on the 9th, so we would probably do the <laughs> working group session maybe the week before, so like the first Friday of the month. 9th of what month? Of March, so we'd start the, 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 the next uh, round table. What we're looking at is talking with policy makers oh, yeah. and looking at policy issues uh, so that it will bring in people who are actively involved in policy, both at the city, state, and private levels. So that as we're thinking of shifting language for policy, 
uh, sharing thoughts of people who are doing it. That's right. But if we could have think about having a, a sort of standing first Friday for the working groups. And just very quickly for our group, if um, Lynette and Claudia would just pop up before you leave, I appreciate it. That'd be great. That'd be to come see so listen thank you everyone this is really really exciting to think about the potential that we have assembled here and, and the, the steps forward uh, and I, I really think uh, we're already going to generate a lot of excitement when we uh, go national with this call. And, and it will be wonderful to see what kinds of other responses we get as well. So thanks so much, everyone. If you have questions,